Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived. Welcome to another in the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday series. And see, we got it right that time again. I'm off to a roll already. Today's going to be a kind of a fun one, talking about backups and STLs. Now, we've got some stellar guests with us today, from uh, well, both from Telesomnia, as a matter of fact, and uh, leading the pack, but uh, not necessarily, well, yeah, first in our hearts, at least, we've got uh, the one, the only Kirk Harnack. Kirk, welcome. Thanks for uh, sharing some time with us today. Hey, uh, glad to be here. Let me fix the camera and do a little shading. There we go. Hi. Hi, Jeff. Good to see you and glad everyone could join us. Now, see, you can tell the TV weather guy he's doing cameras and shading. I'm lucky that I actually have a camera at all. Um, I'm lucky to remember the word shading. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, and also we've got Paul Kriegler, U.S. Sales Manager for Omni Audio, and uh, Paul's going to talk about some things too. I just came back from the hairstylist. Good job. They did an excellent, excellent piece of work. I may have to get your uh, stylist number because I'm way beyond. So, as always, when we uh, get rolling on one of these things, we do have a few housekeeping notes. Um, there are we not only expect and encourage your questions we require them because without uh, audience participation these things get a whole lot more boring uh, you can type your questions in you can hit the hand raise an icon and i will uh, see it if uh, you don't look like you're going to frighten me too badly we might even un unmute your microphone and let you ask the questions live so sounds great um, Mark Voris says your hair looks good, Paul. So uh, see, we're responding to questions already. Jeff Wilson. Oh, and the other thing that I don't mention nearly often enough, we've got uh, Ed Sylvester, our uh, marketing specialist at Nautel, is uh, behind the scenes. He's the producer. He makes us all look good. And uh, Jeff Wilson, one of our sales guys, said he wants to see Ed on camera, but I'm not sure we can get Ed to turn the camera on or not. Uh, if he shows up, you'll know he's there. So yeah, he's the, uh, like I say, we call him disembodied voice. He's the guy in the background that just uh, waves his hands and uh, the, the puppet stance. It's awesome. So we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Oh, one other thing. If you're an SBE member, I saw Wayne Piscina's logged in. Uh, kudos to the president of the SBE for joining us. But uh, the completion of an Autel webinar does give you half of an SBE recertification credit under Schedule I, so Category I of the research schedule. So remember to uh, fill in your form if you're coming up for certification renewal. All right. So this is the same agenda we use for every one of these Tech Talk Tuesdays. The great and there, see, I got it wrong that time. But the great thing is that uh, it means it's one less slide I have to create. I'm a big fan of keeping things simple. Uh, so the comment is backups and Kirk you and I first met oh it was early 90s you were engineering a 50 kilowatt in Memphis that had one of our stations or one of our transmitters that's right that's right it, it was a huge uh, 50 kilowatt transmitter man that thing was enormous no uh, about 14 feet long six feet high weighed somewhere around uh, three tons if I remember right and, and, uh, and not a tube inside yeah and it's funny because the only reason I remember it is because you called one night and the thing was down and we found a a part anyway transistor diode in in one of the power supplies and that for some reason stuck in my head twenty some odd years later so I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing but uh, we've known each other that long. Wow. So uh, Paul on the other hand, Paul and I haven't known each other quite as long, but. Uh, Paul, your experience has been more on the other side of the microphone, right? You're PD and uh, and uh, the the voice on the air, so to speak. Yeah, I was a program director in some major markets back in the late 90s, uh, early aughts, and uh, cut my teeth in radio in Omaha, Nebraska, and right here in Austin, Texas in the early 90s. And that's where I came back about three years ago when I joined TELUS. Very cool. It's a it's a beautiful town and a lovely state. I've spent uh, more than a little time uh, kicking around Texas with uh, Don Jones, Ray Reed, John Lackness, and several other reprobates. Uh, a couple of folks have already commented about the transmitter that Kirk was engineering. Uh, and uh, so Marco and Dave, that was an ND50. And the cool thing about that particular one, it was serial number one from the Bangor facility. We'd built a few in Halifax prior to then, but this was the first one that came out of Bangor, Maine for, an, for a 50 kilowatt AM. 
So that was kind of cool. So again, talking about backups, um, the first thing we obviously have to do, and, and uh, Paul, going back to the PD days, I, I'm assuming that you've had the panic of being off air more than once. Yeah, in Atlanta, a couple times we had a massive uh, automation crash that would take six radio stations off off at one time. That happened to us twice, and then after that, that didn't ever happen again. And right. um, you know, there was uh, an issue in Tulsa where we had a massive ice storm. And I would say 60% of the FMs in the entire market were off the air for at least two or three days, uh, including us. Uh, we were off at our studio side for at least 24 hours until they got the electricity on there. And then the transmitter site um, took a week, but we, uh, we had to figure out our own backup there for a little while. Mm -hmm. And so number one thing that we come to with stuff like this is, is it necessary? Um, and it's not just the cost of the backup, but you've got to look at the, the risk factor. I mean, what are the odds? For example, if I've got two things connected with a piece of wire, what are the odds that piece of wire is going to fail? Well, if it's inside a building, not really high. If it's in the middle of a field and they're doing construction next door, the odds go up a little bit. Uh, Kirk, I think you've probably got at least one or two stories about backhoe fade, for example. Oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, and 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 I'll, I'll just mention it now. Most of our stations are in small towns in uh, Mississippi or in Hawaii uh, or in American Samoa, and a lot of the uh, the internet service providers there have only one connection to the outside world. And uh, you know, I, I read recently that if if you are like me, you're you're, you're an engineer. You, 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 you can read a map, um, you can read a compass. If you're ever lost out in the wilderness, uh, the quickest way to actually find where you are, let's say you have no cell service, find where you are is whenever you go hiking, carry a piece of uh, probably a good, you know, 10, 20 meter piece of fiber uh, in your backpack. And if you're lost, you should just lay the fiber out on the ground and sit down and wait because eventually a backhoe will come along and cut it in two. Then you can get a ride with the backhoe operator to, you know, to to civilization because it's it seems like in the small towns that we're in, um, the uh, the only time the internet fails is if there, a tornado has come through and hit the radio station, which we'll get to, or somewhere along the uh, the Mississippi River, a, a backhoe has taken out the fiber, and it's the only fiber that you know this pr particular ISP has. So yeah, you need to have other ways to get internet. Um, and by the way, that, that means everybody in town is out of internet. So it, it's it's difficult to do much much of anything. There are ways to get around that, and we'll 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 hit them uh, as we move along today. Yeah, and uh, I ran into a situation once where, and, and of course, typically if you go off the air, the first thing they do is call the transmitter folks because hey, we're off the air. Um, okay, are you making power? Yeah, we're making power. Okay, do you have audio going into the transmitter? Well, we don't know, but there's none on the receiver. Okay, well, let's take a look. Um, we had one situation where the station went down every day within plus or minus five minutes at 2.30, and it was consistent. And so one day the engineer, he's at the transmitter site, and we've measured, and the transmitter's staying up, everything's beautiful, the audio's dropping out. Turned out it was a FedEx truck parking in front of their satellite uplink. Oh, wow. So... You know, it's uh, it's the silliest thing some days. It uh, and uh, of course the northern latitude, a satellite dish is aimed almost like this, yeah, yeah. you know, as opposed to like this. So, uh, so yeah, it, uh, it it very much takes some troubleshooting sometimes, and uh, maybe in that case a backup wouldn't necessarily have been required. But uh, hey, but Jeff, you, you've got a you, yeah. you've got a good slide up right now, and if you don't mind, I've got a, a couple thoughts on uh, on the, the slide that that you have on here. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the, the the best way to have a backup to not go off the air is to have two of everything, right? Two studio locations uh, that you go to, fed by different electric companies, uh, each uh, in each of them having backup generator. Two transmitter sites. Uh, I've worked at stations, an AM station that had a day site and a night site, and we could legally operate from the night site during the day, but not vice versa. And so sometimes we did because the day site also had an FM antenna on it. And so sometimes we'd have to do maintenance on the FM antenna or something there. So we would simply put the AM on the air from the night 
night which also meant we had a we had an STL to, to the night side the day side was co-located with the studio but you you can go really overboard and literally have two of everything um hey you could even get two general managers two sales staffs and and two on air staffs uh, but I dig digress the question comes in your risk analysis and your maintenance simple things to do and, and other thoughts uh, what do you really need to duplicate in a typical environment? And uh, and I think we can all go through those mental exercises. What are the things, you know, what's bitten us in the butt, you know, in the past few years? Uh, what's likely to go off? We all know electricity is fairly likely to go off um, uh, at, at some point through the year. We know that uh, if you're in a place that does have ice or we, if you have one FM antenna for transmitting, at some point, you're going to have a problem. You're going to get water in the coax. You're going to get some Yahoo shooting at it with a with a rifle. Uh, you're going to get a, a incursion that way. You're going to get a burnout. You're going to get ice on the antenna. Something's going to, or you're going to just need maintenance done or a light bulb replaced. And you got to reduce power a lot or go off the air completely while a tower crew is, is on there. So, you know, a, a backup antenna is probably a good thing to have. Um, uh, at our stations, we've been able to arrange it. At, and my stations are are poor rural radio stations. We just got to scrape by with what we can. But in some acquisition, we ended up with a broadband FM transmitting antenna. It's just one bay, but we can put any of our stations on that antenna should we suffer an antenna failure with, uh, with one of our other stations. Some of our stations are combined into one antenna. Others are on their own antennas. So it, it varies widely, but you got to do what you can. Um, we've taken, for example, some of our stations, we have put older uh, exciters and transmitters that are not easily retunable. That way we can keep a retunable exciter, uh, you know, dip switch or front panel, something that's easy to do. Uh, we can keep that for emergencies and, and, and shuffle it around to where it needs to go should an, an exciter die. Uh, we've always tried to have two sources of, of STL to a site. We're not successful everywhere, but at some sites we've been able to have two sources of STL. And when we get to it, I've got a, a couple of good ideas on that. Um, uh, that one, you know, one, one that you may not have thought of that actually has worked for us. So consider what your weakest points are, what is going to do the most damage, and try to have a backup for, for that kind of thing. Well, that's that's what I want to say about about that. E either buy two of everything or back up the things that that can hurt you the most. Nope, that's a, a really good point. We'll touch on that again in a couple of seconds too. About two more slides down, as I recall. And uh, the other thing, and the the note I make in the top right corner here is the backup needs to be more reliable than the main because hmm. main has the luxury of going down if you have a backup. The backup does not have the luxury of going down and. Uh, I was telling the story when we were doing our little practice run about the uh, time I was at NAB. We got a um, we we got a big storm here. Uh, power went out, and uh, get, my wife called me, and we were walking her through how to start the generator. And she goes, "Well, I pushed the red button, and nothing happened because somebody had uh, forgotten to exercise the generator on a regular basis, and the battery was dead." Um, on the topic of Tua, everything. Shane Tovin's in the audience, and. Uh, he uh, made a comment to uh, to disembodied voice, Mr. Edward Sylvester. And so, Shane, your your mic's unmuted. Tell me what you were thinking. Hey guys. Uh, so yeah, I uh, I have, this is a topic that's pretty uh, pretty near and dear to me. I have seen the the good, the bad, and the ugly um, along these lines. So regarding two of everything, uh, I mean that's it's easy. I mean if you've got the money, it's easy to it's great to have the temptation. You know you're gonna have the temptation to want to just duplicate everything. Um, the problem is with that approach, if you don't keep everything in exactly the same standards and exactly the same configuration, well, suddenly your backup is no longer quite a backup, and it may or may not work uh, the way you expect it to when you need it. There may be a software conflict or a firmware conflict of some sort. That becomes more of an issue these days. Um, the other thing that I've seen is cases where something is borrowed from a backup chain. <laughs> oh, it's just a backup. We're <laughs> we could take that and put it over here. Uh, well, you can about guess how well that uh, that ends up. And um, yeah, so the other, I mean, the final comment I have is uh, in terms of simplicity, sometimes keeping it simple is in fact better. Um, just, uh, you know, these are all great points. And I really, uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk about this today. Well, our pleasure. And uh, it is one of the things that we heard a lot of uh, 
back in the day, uh, ABC, for example, used to, if they bought one of anything, they bought two of that thing. And that way they had identical configurations for, for the main and the standby. So you could switch any piece from over here to over there and not think of anything. Um, I'm seeing a couple of comments about uh, STLs and uh, and um, IT backups. Uh, just, uh, scrolling up, I've, I've got a question window here with uh, things are moving faster than I can keep up. But uh, Mark Forrest mentions uh, backup internet. And these days, more and more, the IT is much less an option than it is a necessity. So yeah, having a backup internet path is a really good thing. And that'll dovetail Kirk very nicely into what uh, you and Paul are gonna be talking about in uh, probably about 15 minutes from now. Um, Dave Reitner mentioned the same thing with STLs. If you've got a radio STL and a wired STL, you've got the best of both worlds. And uh, that also ties into something that uh, Kirk is gonna bring up. So, uh, so yeah, it's just some really good comments. Keep the comments coming, folks. Uh, I'd say I do have the uh, question window open. And I'm, so if you see my head bobbing around like I'm looking for apples, that's exactly what I'm doing, trying to uh, keep up with the things blown by the screen. Um, flick into the next slide. Uh, so Ed, his uh, lovely bride, Fiona, is also in our marketing department. And Fiona threatened me, uh, sorry, asked me very nicely if I would uh, remember to mention the uh, ebook we have up. And uh, when we're talking about backups, it, it does seem very, very pertinent um, with uh, the considerations for buying a transmitter. A lot of those considerations are similar for installing any backup. I've had uh, I'll give you an example. I've got uh, customers in Western Canada that uh, we were putting in a new transmitter for them a million years ago. And uh, while we're putting this in, they're on their backup. And I went to turn ours on into the dummy load. And he said, wait, wait, I got to turn on the generator. And I said, why? And I, he said, because if I don't, we'll go into the next demand level and our power bill goes up about $2,000 for this month. And less an issue with smaller transmitters, but again, another one of those things that just being aware of it, you can uh, save your station a, a whole bunch of money in the long run. So Kirk, we were talking about uh, the broadband antenna. You were talking about the one that, uh, that you and Larry have down in Delta Radio. And this is something that I've put together here and there. CPB did something, I wanna say about a year ago. Um, so if you're a, a public radio station and uh, Go to CPB and look up uh, backup transmitter, and they've got a little configuration kit. But it's basically, an anvil case, Pelican case, uh, pick your uh, case of choice, uh, some sort of uh, codec or STL receiver. In this case, I think Kirk recognizes what I've got because I stole it from one of his slides. And uh, just a, a little transmitter. This is a Shively Versatune antenna, so you can tune it to any frequency, something like that, a foam pole and 100 feet of Superflex. And the cool thing about the Versatune is it ships flat packed in a cardboard box about two inches high. So the transmitter, the uh, micro MPX, the Versatune and a hundred feet of Superflex coiled up would all fit into a Pelican case that's only about a foot, foot and a half high. So you could have a portable backup system. So no matter what happens, you get a transmitter site in a box. Um, Kirk, so just uh, flick it over to you for a moment because this is uh, very close to what you guys are doing, isn't it? It sure is. Uh, the little um, half rack box there is, is we're going to be looking at that technology in a few minutes uh, and give you some ideas about different ways to use it. But that what Jeff is showing here, uh, it looks like an Axia X node, but actually there's no there's no Axia, there's no live wire uh, in it. Uh, what that is, uh, is um, that would be the decoder end. It converts micro MPX, which is the MPX, the composite FM signal uh, generated at supposedly at your studio site, uh, either generated by an encoder that looks like that or in software that's available, uh, sent over the internet at a very modest bit rate. I say modest, it's about four, a minimum of about 400 kilobits per second. And uh, if you can get 400 kilobits per second to a transmitter site, you can decode micro MPX and turn it back into beautiful and clean um, analog FM composite, FM multiplex, and run that into your, your Nautel uh, exciter transmitter and be on the air. And Steve Neprath over in uh, Wilmar, Minnesota makes a uh, good point. He's used a computer at the transmitter site as a backup audio feed with their internet stream, logging into it remotely, switching it over and starting the stream on the computer. 
then he says with compressed audio and delay, it's not ideal, but you know, some signals better than no signal at all. And, and Paul, um, what are, what are some of the sketchy things you've had to do in the past to get a signal on the air? I'm, I'm guessing there must be something. Who, me? Um, <laughs> well, here was the great thing. That ice storm that took us off the air for two days was a tremendous turning point for us. Um, our new general manager saw what had happened. He had just come on board uh, about nine months before um, before this ice storm event happened. So things got put in place over the following two years with new transmission line generators for our sister station site. We threw a backup um, <clears throat> a backup uh, situation together and got that all licensed off of our sister station's transmitter, um, and and we had. We didn't have two of everything, but we had a legitimate working backup, which we could get back up uh, and going with. So um, I, my favorite off my favorite story is this engineer that I worked with in Tulsa. Um, he, he was at the transmitter site doing some work and we were on the backup and he turns the backup off and turns the main back on, leaves, goes to a nearby gas station as I'm uh, He's not answering his phone, and I'm the program director of the station, and I've got the GM looking at me, I've got the air talent looking at me, every radio, it's been confirmed that we're off the air, and, and I call him on a cell phone, and he's arguing with me that we're on the air. I think it was probably 10 watts coming from the exciter, maybe 12 watts somehow leaking through to the to the transmitter, which happened to be about a half a mile away from him. So um, all kinds of stories from my time in radio, but... Um, there's nothing worse as a program director than not being able to serve the community at a time of need, such as an ice storm or something like that. That's that is when radio truly can shine, and that is, to me is one of the most important reasons for as a licensee to have a backup is just to continue to serve the community of license when things happen, such as a storm or ice storm or hurricane, whatever the case might be. Right. Exactly. And that's one of the things John uh, Van Milligan mentions that uh, their main transmitter site has two radio STLs, two channels each, and an IP link all running into Axia X nodes so they can switch any input anywhere. And this is where the, the IP, the audio over IP and IT related things really shines because the ability to route it without having to have a physical path is, is huge. And uh, so that's kind of a, the, that and Paul's comment about storms is kind of a, a good segue into uh, this story. So Kirk, I'm going to get you to talk to the slides and you can just kick me ahead when you get done talking about one. There's three or four and I know you haven't seen them in advance. So this is going to be a surprise for you and fun for all of us. I've seen them. I just don't know which ones you uh, you killed in order to keep our, our meeting length uh, reasonable. This was a uh, 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 a path of a tornado that hit Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, interestingly, it also hit the correctional facility. I'm not sure how many inmates escaped uh, after the roof was blown off the uh, correctional facility. Uh, we won't worry about that. And, and as usual, you know, the tornado goes through some of the poorest parts of town where there are plenty of mobile homes. And so there were uh, plenty of, uh, of mobile homes uh, turned over. And, and I don't know if anyone, I don't think anyone uh, perished in this, but uh, this storm did, uh, uh, this tornado, uh, and we have video of, the wind, uh, you can't see the tornado because we're kind of in it, too close to the for trees to see the forest. Um, but uh, we, the, the tornado went right past our uh, our STL tower. Uh, it, it took out part of a sign. And across the road from us, it took out a whole bunch of those uh, long distance, uh, uh, high voltage transmission line towers. And so in, in the middle, of course, of a muddy Mississippi field, it took the electric company um, literally a week to get the first crane out to the towers. It took them a week and they had to use those, I mean, enormous pallets and just place one pallet before another while they rolled the cranes out in this muddy field. That, that mud is incredible out there. Uh, and, and so they, re they replaced all those towers. But uh, on, at, our at our studio, and I'm guessing we have a picture of the, uh, of the STL tower. There we go. Um, that, and look, I, I know that's a little cheapy home um, a tower. That building was actually built to be a radio station by a competitor of ours quite a few years ago. We ended up buying the building uh, some years ago, and uh, and we got the little uh, uh, tower that came with it. It's a 65-foot, really it's a home tower. In this part of the world, a lot of folks have 
home TV towers because they're so far from uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, they're uh, 40 miles from Greenville. Uh, they're far from Memphis. So people do what they can to, to pick up TV with uh, about a 60, 70 foot tower. This one was 65 feet when it was uh, up. And I got to tell you, that tower with the, the uh, angle iron, worst thing to climb. Oh, it's so hard on your feet. Uh, but we did have um, uh, a Scala, now Catherine, uh, PR uh, uh, 450U type antenna on there. Um, it wasn't at the top. As you can see, it, it got crunched there where the tower fell over. At the top, we had this really cute little uh, uh, ubiquity uh, 5.8 gigahertz uh, antenna. And that was shooting uh, 5.8 gig IP to one of our transmitter sites uh, where we, we were actually shooting live wire uh, Axia Livewire AOIP, perfectly linear audio over that, had been for some years. I've got videos uh, on the web about that. But uh, you know, the it took that down. We, we tried putting that little antenna back up, uh, but uh, it's, it, the tower's no longer high enough. And frankly, uh, we haven't collected the money uh, enough yet to build a new tower. So that had to lead to some other solutions and a solution while we were off the air. We have a very interesting tower site situation, again, due to the acquisition of uh, a couple of radio stations. Um, this is two tower sites that are on East Mound Bayou Road uh, in Mississippi. This is about six or seven miles north of Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, it's out in the middle of a bean field, as you can see, the, the plowed field. We uh, originally owned the, uh, the tower on the right. It's a 350-foot tower. We have two FM stations there. The tower on the left, uh, we bought uh, actually uh, from American Family Radio Network. And so now we're running oldies on it. Um, uh, so, uh, we, we have, and by the way, the, the truck, the, the bucket truck that was shown in the previous slide belongs to a wireless ISP. I am a huge believer in getting internet to your transmitter site by hook or by crook. And, uh, uh there's lots of ways to get it done. Uh, yes, you can do satellite. Hey, we've had satellite internet at some of our radio stations when we had to. Um, we've, uh, we've also used the uh, Max Connect Wireless from Josh Bone uh, in emergency situations. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if, if you're doing 24-hour broadcasting, it's pretty easy to hit a data cap with that. In fact, uh, we, we used that after this, uh, uh, this disaster because we were out of internet from our regular provider at our studio. We were out for almost a week of, of internet. So I brought the Josh Bone box uh, down there, hooked it up. Two days later, got a call from Josh. You guys are using a lot of data. <laughs> Because we uh, we do voice tracks, we do lo uh, you know program length files in and out of there all the time. So yeah, we were using a lot of data. We we did owe Josh a little extra for uh, bumping well, well over our data cap, um, but we had to get back on the air. And the long and the short of it was we ended up using a technology called Micro MPX uh, at at these trans at the studio and and the transmitter site. Uh, I'm not sure what's next. Uh, okay, we, we ended up doing several things. And um, let's stay on this slide for a while. <clears throat> um, we um, <clears throat> we had a rather complicated setup on this one radio station. Uh, it's a uh, it's an it's an R and B format. It's kind of an old school R and B format. And we actually generate the audio in Greenville, Mississippi, which is 40 miles south of, of where the tornado hit. And we have that audio on a station in, in Arkansas. Uh, it's uh, KZYQFM in Eudora, Arkansas. We send that with a standard 950 megahertz STL. It's about a 15, 18 mile shot, works fine. To get it to Cleveland, um, for some years, we had been just using a ZIP-1 from, uh, from Telos, from Greenville to Cleveland, Mississippi. In Cleveland, we ran it through our EAS system there to add a, a separate uh, you know, area of EAS coverage. And then we would send it by live wire up to the transmitter site in Mount Bayou. <clears throat> well, when the tower came down at the studio, the STL tower came down, we had to back up and punt and do something else. And what we did <clears throat> was we ended up keeping the zip ones where they were, <clears throat> and we got a, a, a new Omnia MPX node. So we kept the processor at the, we moved the processor actually from the transmitter to the studio because we had it at the transmitter site because we were delivering live wire to the transmitter site. Brought it from the transmitter site back to the studio and we came out of the processor and went into the MPX node uh, at the studio. Now we just had to get the MPX, micro MPX uh, data about 400 kilobits per second to Mount Bayou. Well, we had a wireless ISP in Mount Bayou. So that's good. 
let's can you flip back to the slide of the two towers? The problem was we needed the we needed the data at the east tower on the right side of the screen. The wireless ISP, for whatever reason, when we traded out with them, they had put their uh, their equipment at the west tower. So we had internet at the wrong tower. So I found a couple of uh, ubiquity um, dishes and, and radios that we had bought as backups and just hadn't put them in place yet. So we had them uh, actually under a <clears throat> under a bunk bed at the radio station. Yes, we have backup, uh, you know, sleeping facilities. And so I put them up. I just did a about a thousand foot hop between the uh, west tower and the east tower. So I got the the data from the wireless ISP at the west tower, shot it over the bean field. I just put the uh, antennas about 15 feet up the tower over to the east tower and verify that I was getting good data there. So I used the MPX node to shoot, uh, to push this uh, micro MPX data through the west tower over to the east tower. Then I took the decoder node, the MPX decoder node, and we'll have a, I think we'll have a diagram of this later on. And I decode that data and we had just fed that analog output into our uh, exciter at the East Tower, and we were back on the air. Now, I know it's a lot of rather cir circuitous route, and later on, we've uh, simplified it a bit. And we were have, we had to use Josh Bone's uh, Max Connect Wireless to get the ZIP1 data to the studio in Cleveland, and then we had to use um, Josh Bone's stuff. And, and we and, anyway, it's, it's it's too complicated to remember it all. But we ended up using the wireless, wireless ISP to get the micro MPX to the east tower, or to the west tower, and my link to the west tower. Well, I got as much stuff as I could fixed, and then I had to go home. When I got home, um, something else went. Out. Oh yeah, that's right. The uh, the commercial internet at the studio had returned after just a couple days of using Josh Bone's um, uh, solution. The wire the the regular commercial sudden link actually is now Sparklight. Sparklight internet returned to the studio. So we got on that. Still using the wireless ISP to get to the transmitter site. Now let's go to uh, my my home studio. When I found out <clears throat> that uh oh, we have no internet now at the Cleveland studio, which was kind of our hot point between the zip one through the EAS system and then on to Mount Bayou with micro MPX. What am I going to do? Well, I remoted into Greenville. I thought, hey, here at my office in Nashville, I've got good internet. And I've got an audio processor. The screen on your left is an Omnia SST running on a Windows machine. The screen on your right is me remoting into the MPX node that I had put at that east tower. I thought, okay, I can get the Omni, the, the, I can get the Zip1 standard left right codec to send me program audio to Nashville instead of to Cleveland. So I sent it to Nashville. I picked it up with my zip one here, right here in the rack. And I took that audio via live wire over to the computer you see on the left of your screen there. And I processed it with Omni SST. And it's got a stereo generator in it. And it's got a micro MPX encoder in it. So now I've got micro MPX stereo coming out of that PC in IP form, okay? And I pointed that to the IP address at the Mound Bayou East, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, transmitter site. It's, it's a static public IP address uh, through the particular port that it's supposed to go to. And so I'm actually pushing it. I'm receiving it in Nashville, processing it, because again, Cleveland has no internet, and pushing it out to Mound Bayou, and then monitoring it with the screen that you see on the right. And it worked. And it ran like this for several days until we had reliable internet returned to the Cleveland studio, at which time I returned all this functionality of the processing back to, to the Cleveland studio. The, the hardware was sitting there. I just had to repoint the zip one and then uh, turn off my encoder here and turn on the encoder at the at the Cleveland studio and send it back to Mount Bayou. So yeah, I had a backup air chain, a backup processor, if you will, in Nashville, Tennessee. And this leads me to believe that, hey, when we can finally uh, get to doing this all in the cloud, and by the way, there are people doing this now in the cloud, you can have a main or you can have a backup system in the cloud uh, as your your backup uh, uh, transmission chain, uh, at least a good part of it. One so of the things that I hear from customers, Kirk, is that they only can get, like, let's say, 64 kilobits per second to their transmitter site. And... I don't know if you've thought about this, but I certainly have. I think we're coming to a point where getting internet is going to be much more ubiquitous here in, in the near future with 
things yeah. like SpaceX <clears throat> satellites, for example. And I'm just wondering if these conversations that, you know, the, these concerns that folks have about not being able to get wireless to their transmitter site um, by hook or crook may become an, you know, easily a thing of the past. Here's one of the good things, you know, in the, in the broadcast business, we, we have uh, for decades borrowed technologies from other uh, disciplines from other other industries like 600 ohms where did that standard come from what well, came from the telephone company punch blocks where did that come from came from the telephone company uh the the whole idea of putting audio uh analog audio on a cat 5 cable or aoip on a cable that came out of the it industry i mean the it industry is freaking enormous compared to us you know for a few years telos made uh, a uh, made a box that would ask, actually distribute ISDN uh, to numerous places. Um, I'll, I'll, and for years we made a uh, a big phone system called the 2101. And it was expensive because it was kind of a one-off. I mean, we invented it, we did it, we used a few telco components, but it's expensive when a small industry has to invent its own stuff. When we can use SIP and VoIP and ethernet switches from Cisco, and the technologies in, involved with those things, now you can have a phone system that costs way less than a, than a Telos 2101 did and sounds better, does more, cheaper service coming in. You know, things get better and better when we can borrow valid, robust technologies from other industries. And of course, IT is the natural thing. That said, yes, we're getting more and more availability of internet at transmitter sites. And the one tip that I would leave at this point is, Find a wireless ISP. They are everywhere. They are all over the place and do a trade with them. They need tower mm -hmm. sites. You need internet. And we've got a trade with a, with a, a company in Mississippi. And uh, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's about three guys and a secretary and they work their butts off. I got to tell you, it ain't perfect, but it's really good. And it gives us internet at the places that we need. I can't say that I would recommend wireless ISP internet at every transmitter site you have. It's best for a backup. We are using it at a, as a main at two sites and it's doing okay, but we do have a few outages. Uh, we're working to get a second path. In fact, we're working to get our tower back up or a different tower there so we can shoot our own audio over IP that we have control of over that. And that'll be our main. Uh, we're keeping the AOIP gear at each end, but then uh, the, the path of the wireless ISP will be our secondary. Yeah, and I've got a few guys here that have mentioned uh, back in the analog world using uh, repurposed phone hybrids for backup program audio at the transmitter site, you know. Sure. It, it's, hey, you're, you're talking about how ugly it was, and it's not ugly if it works and keeps you on the air. This uh, is what I'm doing. Actually, I'll describe very quickly. And we yeah. have a transmitter site with three signals. And actually, there's four, but one of them now belongs to EMF. We have three FMs at a site. It's in a little wide spot on the road called Heads, Mississippi. And my main link there is an IP radio link using live wire over it. Why? Because it was the cheapest thing to do. By mm -hmm. far, it was the cheapest thing to do. Uh, we were already live wire at the studio. We just had to buy an IP radio link. Uh, that was uh, about three grand. And mm -hmm. um, then put one X node, one Axie X node at the transmitter site. Bam, we're done. For under, yeah. under eight grand, we had a whole, you know, we had three FM stations. Actually, we could have gotten four on that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what do we do for backup? Well, we... When we got wireless ISP to that transmitter site, I, as one of our commenters suggested, I put a PC out there, uh, just a Windows PC. It's running great. I'm amazed it's running this long, but it sits there and runs great. doesn't normally do much of anything, but I've got uh, VLC there and I can decode uh, reliably and, uh, and for long periods of time, each of our internet streams. Then I have the Axia IP audio driver on that PC. I can create streams right there. And then I can, uh, at the moment, I don't have a remote way of doing it. I got to send somebody out there and they move a cable uh, that feeds the X node from the IP radio and they move it to the switch to which the computer's connected. Yes, I know I, I, I need to fix that so I can do it remotely. <laughs> but by moving one cable, one cable, we're back on the air via internet using our, on, using our, our internet streams. Yeah, the audio doesn't sound as good. I get it. Uh, but at least we're on the air. And one other thing, Sean Mattingly uh, made a really good point that uh, your backup system is only as good as the documentation for it because backup stuff that you don't have, that you don't know you have isn't really backup stuff. I'm going to try to do something here. If I mess up the slideshow, I'm going to apologize to Ed because right now he is clutching his chest. But uh, Sean has emailed me 
he he has a spreadsheet for his GM with uh, red and green boxes on it, uh, showing where they've got backups, what they've got backups for, um, uh, age of uh, backup transmitters. So if I can get my email to start, which it just did amazingly enough, then we're going to see if we can open Sean's spreadsheet and save it or share it in such a way that uh, it actually doesn't disrupt life too terribly badly. So it opened. Okay, right off the bat, I am amazed and shocked at all this technology and the fact that I have not managed to totally mess it up yet. Um, all right, so we are going to share the screen. We are going to try showing just the window for the backup spreadsheet nice so that gives you an example of the sort of thing you can do um you know and it's just an excel spreadsheet it's fairly simple but at a glance his gm can take a look and know exactly what they what they need to look at improving or what is good to go as it is so yeah like i said and this is something we beat the drum on over and over and over. And it's something that as engineering folks, it's arguably one of our weakest links is documentation. Um, now, Paul may or may not have some thoughts on the documentation aspect of it because he's uh, gotten to see it from the other side of the coin. But, uh, but Paul, is that accurate enough? I mean, uh, in your experience, I know I've run into a lot of sites where there's not a single piece of paper to tell you what goes where. Correct. Um, worked for with a very conscientious engineer um, in Tulsa for a good number of years, and he was a contractor. And when I took over as the chief operator a couple of years before I left to go on to another market, um, he laid everything out. In a, in a very clear, he was very detail oriented, knew exactly, you know, what steps to take and what steps not to take to get stuff done. And it came down to a lot of what you're showing here is, is you know, documenting everything. So, Sean, I really want to thank you for that. I am going to uh, ask you if it's okay to share this with anybody else who wants it. And uh, you can just uh, fire me an email or a, a comment in the questions to let me know. And uh, let's see, I'm seeing a hand raise the icon, so just bear with me while I figure out how to work this. Uh, there's too many buttons on this thing, and I don't have enough brain cells to handle it all. Oh, there, Sean. Okay, well, let's unmute Sean. Okay, Sean, thanks very much for this. I'm going to flick back to it in that case while you're here so you can address it. Yeah, no problem. You can certainly uh, share that out. Uh, the bottom of it lists uh, some critical PCs as well with some red and green squares and it's sort of an easy way for everyone to see you know are we backing up the operating system do we have an image do we even have backups of critical programs on the machine uh, so i have the same for ac power and transmitters uh, above that it's kind of at a glance what we work toward every year at budget time is to try to have more green boxes than red boxes and that's, that's what good we stuff mm-hmm no, that is, and, and I say it's something that is fairly simple to create, but it, it's just, it's huge when it uh, comes to being able to actually make it work. Yeah, and, and when we talk about CapEx projects each year, it's sort of a starting point. It's like, well, we've made some progress. We've got a few more green boxes, but we need a lot more. Exactly. Well, thanks very much again for that. And uh, no absolutely, if anybody wants a copy of this, just uh, send me an email and we'll make it a point to uh, get it out to you. So, all right, back to where we were and we click forward. If I get the right window open now, here we go. Um, and at oh, this yeah. point, at this point, we're going to, uh, I think, bring Paul in a little bit because poor Paul's been sitting here and hasn't had a lot to say. And this is, uh, this is his part to work with the uh, total surprise as far as uh, what the slides are that happen to be presented. <laughs> so um, what are we showing here? FM processor with storage. We're going to assume that's an Omnia 9. Um, Omnia 9 has the micro MPX codec built into it, which you can license for uh, just just a little bit of, uh, of extra cash. Um, you can get your... Um, 
uh, you can get uh, you can feed directly to uh, your network and get the composite over here. What we're showing here is just a comp you know traditional you know uh, FM composite STL transmission chain. And um, all I want to point out this 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 uh, composite STL features all the things that drive uh, program directors a, a little bit nuts. You know, like why doesn't my station sound as as good as as the competitor? If you're using, and many of us still are, I, I've still got you know com, uh, analog, uh, I, uh, analog uh, uh, RF uh, STLs and 950 band. And what I really want to show here, uh, Paul, is 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 that with you know it's 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 just a radio, it's just a a radio transmitter and a radio receiver, 950. There's Subject nothing. Subject to everything that can happen on the, yes. on the UHF band. And 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 uh, I don't know if Jeff kept the slide or not. I, I hope he did because it shows a, a Nautel thing. But uh, uh, you, you know, it shows the noise floor, Jeff, later on in, in the presentation. Oh, I um, don't remember if that one made it or not, but I know the well, one you mean. Well, all the impairments. What I want to get at, Paul, all the impairments that an analog STL system gives you, and you know, we, I don't know, we, we like to think that because they cost so much, they're darn near perfect, and they are not. Not at we all. couldn't we couldn't use this method in the last market that I worked at our our, uh, our STL receivers would have been at 10,400 feet in a high RF zone up on Slide Mountain in Reno. Um, so even though we had perfect line of sight, the band was just way too congestion. There was there was way too many radio stations and TV stations and, and two way and whatnot up there on the mountainside. So the only way that we were really able um, to get our uh, to get a signal to the mountain reliably was uh, using T1 lines from the phone company. Um, later, we got ubiquity radios, and just from having been a program director and having messed with processing enough, I knew that getting the composite output of the audio processor would sound so much better than than the way we were doing it, sending AES up to the mountain and using the exciters mm. and the transmitters to make composite. Sorry, Jeff, but it, it's no, true. No. Um, but it just sounds better, and and this. MPX node product answers um, at a very low bit rate what my desire was uh, five or six years ago, last time I was an operations manager at a radio station, how to get the best sound on the radio, because to me that was um, that was pretty Critical. important. Well, right. you know, with uh, with an analog uh, uh, STL system that shoots composite, where your tra your uh, processor at the studio, remember you're going to have overshoots in that analog system. So a lot of people still have a uh, composite clipper at the transmitter site. That that you know helps with the overshoots. It 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 doesn't help with much of anything else. Uh, and whatever noise and distortion, remember with an analog uh, STL. You have a modulator at the studio, you have a demodulator at the transmitter site, and there's nothing all that great and special about them. I mean, that you're turning uh, you know, audio into RF and RF back into audio in an analog format, so you've got a noise floor, and you've got added distortion, and you've got um, uh, the, the overshoots we already mentioned. All the impairments that show up in that system, you don't have any choice but to transmit. There's no cleaning that up. Once the picture's out of focus, it's out of focus, right? Well, um, the, you, the cool thing is how many times have you run into a set of parallel licensed band STLs where one was off just enough to interfere with the other one? Oh, yeah. We, yeah. we get that call at least once a year. I've seen uh, in, people put composite clippers at the end of their STL receiver to fix the overshoots. Safe. That's never good. One of the things, and Paul, I'm sure you've been this, through this too, but you know, I was hired at, at, at Telos to demonstrate Omnia processors. And sometimes we'd put an Omnia processor at the studio in the chain, and you know, there was still something wrong. And I said to the engineer, I said, you know what, Let's, I'll help you troubleshoot this. Why don't we come back about 11 p.m.? At midnight, we will put the Omnia, we'll take a CD player and or some programming that you have, We'll put the Omnia processor at the transmitter site and, and come out of it and go right into your exciter. And let's see how that sounds. Oh, my God. There was never a time when it wasn't a big improvement. And the engineer then knew, my STL sucks. I yep. never realized how bad my chain was. I always thought it was the processor. And it was my, my STL sucks. So anyway, that, that happened time and time and time again in big markets. Where you yep. put the processor at, 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 you know, you get that composite right in there clean and, uh, and away you go. So let's well, look at the I'm, next. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can say one of the slides we were one of the presentations we did a little while ago talking about that sort of thing. And I mean, everybody, when they think their sound is bad, the first thing they look at is the processor. 
the next thing's the transmitter, but everything between the microphone and the top of the tower. I mean, the antenna itself, the antenna bandwidth can have an impact on your sound. So, you know, more so in AM than in FM, but but yeah, absolutely, there are so many pieces. So uh, sometimes you just got to break it down and uh, move it to one place. Um, one of the comments, uh, Ray Lewis had mentioned that he keeps a couple of uh, Ubiquiti power beam radios and the Ubiquiti bullets on hand because they're they're fast to set up, they're easy, they're cheap as anything, and uh, they're, they're available. Uh, somebody else was mentioning the, the having a WISP set up at their site and uh, how, yeah, it, it's not 100%, it's not 5.9's reliability, but, but by golly, it's internet for the most part. And so that's a really good point. Um, so getting rid of all that analog RF stuff. I, uh, I, I want I want to touch for 10 seconds on, on the WISP thing. Uh, yeah. I've got I've got a bunch of sites that I take care of in America in well, they're all in America, uh, in Mississippi, Arkansas, Hawaii and American Samoa. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to drive Ed crazy. Here. I'm going to move my camera. <laughs> I, monitor, I ping all the sites all the time right here and where you see red. Well, that's a problem. So we had a we had some wisp problems going to Mount Bayou overnight. So we were off the air for a little bit around midnight and 1 a.m. Uh, that's that's 48 hours worth of pinging to all the sites that I take care of. This is a multi ping by Pingman Tools. Uh, I used to pay for it. Uh, I, I I just I'm not getting updates on it now, but it it works fine. You can choose how often you ping. I ping every 30 seconds uh, every site, and that lets me know. Uh, a kind of a quality, a proxy quality in, indicator for my various sites. By the way, if all the sites have a problem at exactly the same time, it's me. Yeah, right. Always. It's my internet then. So yeah. uh, oh. what? We're, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, Mark. Mark uh, Voris commented just now that he uses a program called the Dude to monitor all his ISP connections for all his sites. So it's. So I'd, I'd love to learn how to use the Dude. I need to give Mark a call. Maybe I can have Mark. <laughs> on this week in radio tech and and he can explain how to use the dude i've wanted to do that i bet the dude I, I like the i'm sorry that's a line from the movie sorry never mind <laughs> <laughs> all right carry on kirk so um uh i i i realize it's a brand new product there's a lot of folks who don't know what it is but uh you may have heard of this uh protocol called micro mpx it has the ability it's a codec but it's not a psychoacoustic codec it's a mathematical codec not psychoacoustic. So uh, the micro MPX codec takes your entire analog MPX signal, I say entire, up to and including the RDS signal. So from zero to RDS, uh, it takes that signal from any FM processor, doesn't have to be an Omnia processor. Uh, it takes that signal in as analog uh, on the BNC connector and it codes it at, and you could choose the bit rate between about um, 320 kilobits and 576 kilobits, and it encodes it, it puts it in an IP format, and then sends it out where you tell it to go out to. At the transmitter site, you receive that with an um, Omni MPX decoder, so it's a micro MPX decoder, and it turns it back into analog MPX to feed into your transmitter. Now, I got to tell you, the, the easiest way to answer a whole lot of questions about the Omni MPX node is to tell you what it doesn't do. OK, because people ask, well, does it do this? Does it do that? Does it do this? It's cheap and cheerful. It does exactly what I said. It doesn't. It's not appropriate for HD radio. Hang on. Probably solutions will come down the pike. It, it does not do end to end GPIO. It has local GPIO to do various functions on each box, but it doesn't. It's not a replacement for your remote control. It does not send audio back the other direction. OK, it's one way. It is a one-way STL over IP for your analog composite signal, and it does that really well, and that's exactly what it does. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry, just hang on that slide for just a second longer. Um, Jeff, I want to point out that something that we just added is that it does dual path. Can you flip back, back to, the, to the dual path, Jeff? There we go. Uh, because this is critical. Now, at my sites, at the moment, I've only got a single path uh, to the sites where I have a, my, an Omni MPX node. But if you can provide dual path, one of them could be your own IP radio, one could be public internet, uh, uh, one could be your own dark fiber, wh whatever you've got available, um, you can use as the other path. And so you can send dual path, and if you miss a packet on one path, 
the, res the decoder will pick it up from the other path instantaneously. Yes, we're using double the bandwidth here. We're sending, you know, let's say you're sending at 400 kilobits per second. You're using 400K on each path, but you are almost entirely assured not to miss a packet. Now, I will point out, though, that that the uh, Omnia MPX node does offer forward error correction. Now, that comes at a price. You You end up with a higher bandwidth. But let's say that bandwidth is not your problem, but missed packets are. Well, that's very typical, and that's my problem with my links. Bandwidth is not a really a big problem, but missed packets are a problem. So if I can uh, do the forward error correction, it's amazing how well that works. I constantly see about a 3% packet loss on one of my, on a shot to a translator, and the forward error correction, I've never seen it not correct the missed packets. About 3% all the time of my packets are missed. They're kind of random. Now, sure, if you miss a whole bunch of packets in a row, forward error correction can't fix that. But if you miss packet here, packet here, packet here, packet here, forward error correction absolutely fixes that. And that's that's built in. Whether you have one path or two, just one path, you can dial in how much forward error correction that you want. Okay, next one. I don't know if, if Shane Toven is still available to uh, comment on this, but this is uh, a situation that Shane uh, has rigged up. Um, Jeff, can you see if Shane might be available to describe this? I'm still here, guys. Oh, great. Shane, why don't you take okay. it away and tell us what's going on here? So this is this is kind of a unique situation. You have to be kind of careful here about uh, you know whether or not this fits within your um, regulatory parameters. But there was a case where I needed to get an off-air signal from one uh, you know into a into a location. Unfortunately, I could not get that off-air signal into that particular location. Just for I mean there was a lot of localized noise at that location. So basically, I needed a long piece of coax for my receive antenna. <laughs> essentially but uh so what i what i did was i was able to take the receiver in an mpx node put it over at another location pick up what i wanted to receive and bring it back to where i actually wanted it and it worked out uh worked out quite well so you uh you're you're doing a bit rate uh, probably half a megabit per second from the receive site where you have a clean reception through, through, I think you said your company WAN is involved there, so you've got you've right. Got, you they know. were they both happened to be on the same network, so it wasn't a big deal. Uh, and yeah. uh, just uh, off it goes. <laughs> wow, um, Jeff, did you determine if you have that slide of the cleanliness involved here? I it's do got, not have it right okay. here, but it was so, a huge drop in the noise floor. Yeah, a a, a, a Canadian broadcaster provided us with screenshots off the Nautel AUI that shows the the uh, the baseband. Um, uh, from zero up through uh, probably one of the subcarrier areas, although that was quiet. And uh, with a traditional composite RFSTL, you know, the noise floor was 65, 68, maybe 70 dB down. A few places there was uh, there were some spikes where there were some um, harmonics uh, of either the, the pilot uh, or the 38 kilohertz or maybe the RDS. But there was some there was some noise there and some uh, and some uh, artifacts, if you will. That was on the uh, the you know the traditional RF. When he went over to the Omnia Micro MPX, he had the you know the same same left plus right pilot left minus right RDS, and the noise floor between like the pilot protection was almost 100 dB, and the noise floor above the RDS was below the ability to measure. It was 100 dB or better. Yeah. And you know, when you feed a clean, clean, clean signal into your FM transmitter, you're going to have better coverage, better stereo separation. You're gonna have better, uh, longer coverage of the stereo signal itself before you get noise. I mean, you're giving your listeners every benefit. You're giving your listeners receiver every benefit of the transmission. And you really, uh, you're not including any impairments offered by your uh, your older STL system. Well, and that's one of the things you run into a lot, and this goes back years. I mean, when we first started replacing tube transmitters with solid state transmitters, people used to say, now, well, they call and they complain about their new transmitters, like what's the matter with it? Well, now I can hear every hiss, crackle, pop, and everything in the studio, and I got about $20,000 worth of studio upgrades to do. So same deal, whenever you lower the noise floor, you improve stuff, but be aware that there are other things that you may have to uh, pay attention to in the process as well. Um, I'm not sure if he's still nearby the uh, computer, but Andy Lowe over in Michigan had uh, raised his hand and uh, 
Andy, I'm going to unmute you. Um, so if you want to unmute yourself, if you're there, then uh, by all means. Uh, while we're doing that, um, where was it? Marco or Riti? There's the button. Oh, there. Okay, Andy's on. Good deal. Carry on. What was your question again? Um, so we've got uh, two stations, actually now three stations that we finally got internet out to, and we still have the old uh, 950 megahertz um, analog, you know, for the audio sections on there. Our buildings are all Axia from, you know, nuts to bolts. So, I, you know, you were talking about having an Xnode at the, the transmitter site. We've got Ubiquiti Radio set up on there. And, you know, is there any place that I can look and learn about the Ubiquiti Radios to figure out how to set them up so I can actually put X nodes out of the transmitter sites and actually have good audio? That that's a, a good question. And and yes, there is some some setup. Um, I wrote a a pretty uh, for what it was is very thorough paper and, and, and on how to do this. Uh, when you're using IP radios and you're thinking about well, am I just sending regular data out there like uh, like a, from a codec or an FTP transfer or email. Am I using my IP radio link for something simple like that where time isn't critical? The radio can do some resends if it has a, a, a problem. Hey, the radios can even automatically switch frequency if they need to, if there's some, some interference. When you're running live audio over IP that's linear, you have no margin for error. Uh, whether it's AES67, Wheatnet, Ravenna, or Livewire, it was designed to run over a piece of wire that would not introduce any errors. So to use it to substitute an IP radio for a piece of wire, uh, there are some considerations. And and I've had excellent luck, uh, not because I'm particularly smart, but just because I worked at it for a while to figure out what to do. And I had some good advice from Dave Anderson, who used to engineer for the Joy FM network in Florida, and he had he did a bunch of this. Basically, the the advice uh, is that in the IP radio system, you've got to turn off automatic everything. Whatever it does that's automatic, whatever it does for its own error correction, whatever it's done does for its own automatic selection of modulation scheme, the MCS number, whatever it does for frequency hopping, all that you got to turn off. You need the equivalent of a piece of Cat6 from the studio to the transmitter. And if the radio can't do that robustly on its own, then it's not going to work. Some of the tricks I've learned is um, just because like I've got an IP uh, in here and in Samoa, I've got the Air Fiber 5 system from Ubiquity. So it does full time transmit and receive. It's, it's not doing time domain, you know, transmit, receive, transmit, receive. It's doing full time transmit and receive at the same time. And so it's a little easier to work with in, in that regard. Um, um, but you want to uh, not let frequency hopping uh, occur. And, oh, I was going to say, is you want to reduce the bandwidth. You're not interested in a gigabit getting from here to there. You don't need a gigabit. You need a very robust two and a half megabits per second for each live wire channel you're going to send and receive. Uh, and you want some overhead. So what I've done on my IP radios is instead of being 20 or 40 or even 80 megahertz wide, getting the most possible data and the biggest constellation of QAM signal I can from one to the other. Nah, nah, turn all that off. You want to get, you want maybe a, uh, a QPSK uh, modulation scheme, very simple, very reliable, and you want to reduce that RF bandwidth. I've had the best luck with 10 megahertz. That's a narrow RF bandwidth. You're much less likely to be interfered with by somebody else. The receive sensitivity at the other end is much better when you're looking at ten, only a 10 megahertz swath. So uh, those are the settings that that I've put in, um, basically a low MCS number on the modulation scheme. By the way, that's a good thing to Google is go to Wikipedia and look up uh, MCS uh, modulation schemes, and they're all defined, they're predefined, and you want to use a, a lower scheme. Uh, so that's been my secret to doing that. Even the thing, the function where it can even determine the path distance on its own, turn that off, punch in a path number that's about 5% more than you know the actual path number is. That has to do with the the, the, the guard area for the timing uh, of the packets sent on, on a TDMA system. So there you go. That's probably more than you wanted. I can send you, uh, I can send Jeff a link to that paper, uh, Anthony, I can happy to send you a link if you'll send shoot me an, an email. Well, and what I'll do at the end of this, I'll, I'll send you the report, Kirk, with uh, the list of attendees and contact information. So certainly that way you can uh, reach out with anything that uh, anybody's asked for. 
Uh, Aaron Hume had, had made a very similar comment about uh, running with uh, radio links and uh, that um, they've replaced their old land links with uh, Ubiquiti M900s. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's a really good point about tailoring the, uh, the bandwidth of the radio for the uh, throughput you need. It's it's worth putting a period on what I said earlier about the the IP link being perfect. It's got to be perfect for something like Livewire or AES67. For the Omnia MPX node, it does not have to be perfect at all. You can take a pair of Ubiquiti radios out of the box without any much of any configuration and just IP addresses and run the Omnia, uh, the micro MPX protocol across that because it's got room for error. You're going to have buffering at the at the other end. Uh, it has forward error correction. You know, it's going to it's fine if a packet comes in uh, a couple of milliseconds late. It's just fine with live live wire AES67. That's not fine at all. Uh, right. So so the Omni MPX node uh, out of the box IP radios will practically work. Excellent. And last uh, one we had on here, and this is sort of the future talk, but you had addressed this earlier too was uh, cloud-based. Yeah, and Paul, Paul's got some ideas on this too. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things. Maybe Paul has a comment. I think, uh, well, hey, I would love with, I got racks of computers and I would love to pay somebody some money every month and let me host my Rivendell or my Wide Orbit or my, my Harmony or Playout One, whatever it may be, Enco in the cloud, along with uh, this cool thing, the Omnia Enterprise 9S, which is a, and it's on the air at, at a bunch of stations now, uh, fully cloud based or cloud capable. It, it, it runs in, it runs on a Windows machine, can be in the cloud, uh, audio processor with micro MPX. If you license that, send that out of the cloud to your transmitter site, uh, even over a, a couple different ISPs and, uh, and decode that at the transmitter site. Not for everybody, it might be great for backup, might be great for main someday, but it doesn't depend on a physical location for your studio to be working. Hey, your, your studio burns down, a tornado hits it. Uh, you can you can still be on the air doing this. And I did a form of this with that slide we showed earlier with the mm -hmm. processing in Nashville, Tennessee. And you know what? If I had to, I could run a Rivendell here in Nashville and keep that station off the air if something, uh, on the air, I should say, if something happened uh, in Greenville, Mississippi with our with our systems there. So a friend of mine are running an internet station sort of just like this. Um, huh? I've I've gotten composite out of a nine enterprise S copy running in the cloud, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm using the nine X two to stream it um, to the world. But with the automation platform we're using with Zeta to go, it allows remote voice tracking from anywhere on the planet. Um, you can merge logs, and so you can it's just runs on one Windows virtual machine and it costs us about $100 a month and there's no metal in sight anywhere. It's just like having the radio station on your on your browser to control it. And that's something you're gonna see more and more of as we look at things like disaster recovery and uh, the various cloud-based things. I think not too far down the road and I'm, as Kirk and, and Paula both said, a lot of folks are doing it now where we won't need necessarily physical devices other than the microphone connected to a laptop, connected to the worldwide nastiness and uh, do the same on the other end. So Jeff, you and I were on a live webcast on Sunday evening along with Chris Tobin where yeah. the entire production facility was cloud-based. We did a video webcast and it, it could have been audio, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we did a, a video webcast with cloud-based tools and it was pretty amazing. Yep, yep, exactly. And I mean, what we're doing right now, this is uh, hosted totally off-site from any of us. So, yep, exactly, it's very cool. Uh, obviously, closing information, we've gone 10 minutes over and I don't wanna take up too much more of anybody's time. I thank you all for hanging in there with us. Uh, but uh, online uh, act, or resources, our, the webinars are all archived on our website. Uh, we've got our Waves newsletter. I think there should be, I'm probably going to see Fiona chasing me for some content for the next one of those pretty soon, and a YouTube channel. Um, Kirk, I don't have anything from, from you guys that uh, tell us, but I'm sure you've got some resources too. We know we've done a whole series of webinars uh, here lately that have been pretty darn in-depth. Some of them are, are Technically, uh, you know, really worthwhile to get to get your get your teeth into some of the technologies uh, that we're doing. Um, and uh, if 
Uh, Paul, do you happen to know the, uh, the the URL for that over over at Telos? I do not. Okay. But uh, Justin sent me a link. Let me. I can do some searching here. If if oh. if it's if it if it's real easy, I'll I'll give it to you now. If if not, uh... well, while you guys are looking for that, uh, Ray Lewis had mentioned that he was considering adding a second independent IP link link with a, a Barracks Redundex box. He says there's other similar products, but it uses the parallel stream to reinsert dropped packets. Yeah, that's that's a pretty cool technology. Barracks figured out that hey, our boxes themselves don't offer dual streaming, but we can add another box that will then take one stream, split it to two, and at the other end, we'll let we'll you know let you combine that. Uh, so that yeah, there different companies have different ways of of uh, solving this problem. I, we should give a, a a shout out to the folks at at APT Worldcast. Uh, because our uh, Worldcast Systems, because for years they demonstrated with a live link from Scotland to Florida that having dual paths is really the way to go for all, for very good reliability at low cost. They just had two DSL circuits at their mm -hmm. office in in Florida, and and over time, I don't know that they ever had a time when they didn't have uh, where they were off the air with that feed because if one was down, the other was on. If one lost a packet, the other had it. Uh, and, and and vice versa. Uh, those systems, by the way, don't think of them as main and backup. They, they're just two parallel streams, and the decoder just grabs the first packet of the right number that comes in, and if it's missing, it looks to the other stream and and grabs it from there. <laughs> there, I, we could tell a lot of stories about that. There was a a, a, a network in Australia, nationwide network, kind of like kind of like the iHeart of Australia, and uh, they were terrestrial and satellite based for dual path delivery. And uh, they were on the air for months and didn't even know that the satellite wasn't working. Something had been misconfigured because nobody, nobody had a problem. Uh, the, the, the running joke, and I was reading about it on the Transmitter Sites Facebook page the other day. Somebody's talking about a transmitter that had dual microcontrollers and uh, not knowing or not ever seeing one where they were both worked. Because, yeah, it's uh, if you got dual parallel, unless you got something to notify you that something's gone wrong. So... Again, coming back to the need for monitoring and documentation. Um, I'm just going to close it off now, but one other note, uh, SBE 74 has their conference tomorrow and Thursday. I think that uh, I'm not sure who all's uh, in there, but there, I know they've got some pretty good engineering content. Uh, so Mark, uh, thank you for letting me know about that. Go to SBE74.org to uh, see that, another educational opportunity. On that note, uh, Kirk and Paul, I want to thank you very much for spending thank so you, much time Jeff. with us. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jeff. I think I found that link you were looking for, Kirk. I don't know if anybody got it. Or... Actually, I, I found a simple one. Maybe you found the same thing. If you just go to success.telosalliance.com, success.telosalliance.com, you can have the, the showcases on demand, including... Uh, the one we did on the FMMPX, uh, uh, you know, re real, more real world stories. You got to see the guy from Sweden who did a video for us. Oh my God, he's great. Uh, but success, success.telusalliance.com. So on that note, folks, I want to thank you very much for hanging around with us and we'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Have a great day.